Hi, guys, it's Neil Brennan. I have a podcast that you're listening to. I'm tired of explaining the premise. The premise is that I have a Netflix special called Blocks, and then Jimmy Carr had the idea that I have my friends on talk about their blocks. Today's guest is the best friend I've had on this show. This guy's one of my best friends I've ever had on earth. This guy is what we like to call a Paul bearer. Oh. You're bearing my Paul. That's great. Is that six deep or four deep? What do you think? <laughs> it depends who I'm talking to. Okay, gotcha. If like things are normal, normalized till, toward the end of my yeah. life, there are some people that will get the call. But um, you're trying to stay lean enough that four could do it. I'm trying to send a message to people that I kept my weight around 150 pounds, gotcha. like most human beings so should. You're basically saying I won't need five and six. Not unless- gonna need them. That's a courtesy. Right. That's about friendship, and that's not about letting people know we kept around 150. We lived a life of discipline. My guest, guys, is Seth Myers. Now, Seth Myers, I didn't um, look at your Wikipedia page, but Don't how many to. Emmy wins do you have? Just the one. You only have one. I only have one. Yeah. The courtesy is to say, you know, I'm I'm a 30. 30- nine time well that's what i was nominee. gonna say how many nominees nominees uh, it's yeah. a massive number and i've won one <laughs> a, well, a massive and number i think you could argue the only reason i won i won music and lyrics with mulaney and justin timberlake so and that was i think the the academy their eyes i think their eyes were drawn up to when, it and three of the other four nominees were lonely island songs and i think it was a classic they split they blasted apart the category because too many people had Will to choose re- between. I'd like to bring Lorne into this as quickly Great. as possible. Lorne, once you and Mulaney won, then immediately kind of shifted over to shitting on you a little bit. Yeah, being it's funny not about this. It. There's some famous songwriting duo. I can never remember it, but I remember John and I walked in the second af- the first song monologue we wrote after we won. Our Emmy. It was some version of Lauren going, well, we're ranking in bass are here. Like some, <laughs> it's not that, but it I was, think it was Rogers and Hart. It was, the, yeah. I think that's who you told me it was. In my head, yeah. it's Rogers and I don't even know if that's a real song writing duo. It was so funny because it was derisive. It was as derisive as it was dated, but it yes. was the, we were the right, we were the right audience for it. But it was, it was the thing I like to always say about Lauren is he's a comedy writer first yes so he has all of the resentments that a comedy writer would have like if another comedy writer wins an award he's like fuck that guy even though it's on his show even though it's on his show right his show he got the money he's get uh, fuck it that goes guy. in his tally of the unbreakable record of how many emmys snl has won no one will ever catch snl for total emmys by a television show saturday night live an hour I guess that's Emmy. True. Yeah. I like mean, 60 minutes and it's 200 plus. Also, I think it's primetime Emmys. So even 60 minutes, I bet even 60 minutes in whatever the news Emmys are called. Nemmys? Is that it? Nem- so. The Nemmys. The Nemesis. Yeah. <laughs> the Nemesis. <laughs> um, you're a pallbearer. Uh, I want to go over our friendship. Uh, we met in, oh, I'm going to go oh, 20 years ago. Yeah. 2002 or three. That seems about right. That's how, that's where I carbon it too. yeah um and it is carbonate because it yeah, is yeah. it is worthy of our an archaeological dig uh universities will study this friendship for for uh millennia okay so there's a guy named mike Schur. mike Schur back then was a writer for Saturday Night live i'd written a couple movies with him this is kind of before cell phones kind of ghosted me <laughs> 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 kind of just like was like that eh. and then um he started writing a lot with you Yes. Then sure got a job on like the reboot of the British office. Wasn't going to work. LA. I think we can all agree. Wasn't going to work. Not going to work then. Not going to work. Not going to work. Wasn't going to work. Wasn't going to syndicate well. I uh, got a job in the British office, moved to LA or the reboot of the British office, moved to LA, kind of ghosted you. We were then. <laughs> I don't. I more think he just had other things to do. He didn't live. He was a hanging out friend, and you can't be a bi-coastal hanging out friend. All right. Well, here's what we've learned as adults. Once you have a wife and children, then it then you're not available. Before then, you, you're you a hanging out friend. I don't yes. care what coast you're on. I yes. don't care. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I'm not here to assail, sure. No, I mean, I, I am now in his position. I started later. I have a 
I have a wife. I have three children. I have one more child. He ghosted sure. you before he had kids. Now, he goes to you Did before. Not me. <laughs> and we're, we're, again, not here to assail the great Mike Shirk. History has <laughs> You're proven we were wrong. Back around. We were wrong. We, we were, were like wrong. the guys who are like fucking Edison bailed to do work on his inventions. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then whatever. Multiple, so, because again, uh, and it is still called the British reboot. The British reboot of the, the, the you know, the American reboot, reboot of the, of the British, British office. office. Yeah, That's yeah, what they yeah. Call it. Starring Steve Kerr, the guy from The Daily Show. And he's gone on to do, I mean, Parks and Rec. The sure good did place. Parks and Rec and The Good Place and Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Brooklyn I think he's created by. I, he's a producer on Hacks. Yeah. He's done a lot of things. And and also Aziz's show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's sure has done. We were, An we were, we were left in his dust it was yeah it was, if we had thank goodness we did not go on the record in the press shaking our fists saying you will rue the day <laughs> that you stopped that attending you to us as friends our nest yes because this is not professional to purely friendship yeah. now yeah i say all that to say this which is it brought us together a hundred percent as two guys who have been ghosted we Bye. had, I think I would, and again, you keep saying you don't want to assail him and keep using a <laughs> negative term. I would say we both had a sure sized hole in our lives. We did. That we puzzle pieced into we did. for each other. When I met you, you were a cast member of Saturday Night Live. Yeah. You were on an, it, an incredible, well, great, <laughs> great. Didn't want to say it. You were like an Olympic trial with world record holders. Your cast was Fred. Armisen, Bill Hader, Andy Samberg, Kristen. But Wig. when we first meet, it's not that yet. No, they're 2006-ish. Oh wow! So our early days, it's more. That was like the second wave. It, it's of, feral and those bumps. Yeah, it's mostly. It's not even competition with others, which was to come later. It was more just, can you actually do the job like that? When you met me. I the was, Tina was there. Tina was head writer. The guys in the cast at that time are Fallon, Tracy, oh. Tan, Parnell, Farrell. Killers. Yeah. And Killers. so there was a nice, I mean, I had room to move. I, you know, there was room for me to succeed, but I was sort of just, it was not clicking for me. Early. I think I had one of those things that a lot of people have a little grace period where you kind of pepper your way through the first half of your first season and people say, oh, I like what I'm seeing from that person. But then once you actually have to... Meaning you you would write sketches that were like, they have good premise, good yeah. structure. Right. Maybe like, it's not going to get on, but, but like I we wrote see something. I wrote something with Tina and Amy that was a parody of a pregnancy test commercial where the whole joke was it, Amy and I were a couple that were so relieved it was a, a negative. And it was back when commercial parodies would rerun and rerun on SNL. Yes. So that whole first fall, there was like this good sketch that I was in. It was quiet, but people liked the joke. People liked seeing Amy and I together. I was definitely and would continue to for a decade. I feel like um, what I, what's the biking term where you're just like drafting, drafting. off someone? Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was like the first of many times I drafted off uh, Polar's Charisma. So I had like those little things. But then I would say in the second half of my first year into my second year, all of a sudden you just have to be like a little bit more like you have to have more structural integrity because they give you more to do. And right. that was when I was that was a rough time because I wasn't quite executing at the level that was expected of me or that I expected of myself. And I really started to doubt if I could do it. But I was staying alive by writing. Like I would I would write big group scenes and I would give myself a couple good lines in it. And then I was sort of secretly adding value that way. What did you think your life and career were going to be? At what because point? I, Starting I don't, when? Because, all right, I see you as, of course, me if I went to prep school. <laughs> you I didn't should, go I, to prep no, school. <laughs> you did not go to prep school. And you're not especially high. Like, your parents aren't, like, upper, like, you know, pipe smoking. They don't have boats no. and all that shit. No. Lauren once described me to you as, like, he's you but 10% angrier. <laughs> I think that's probably right. Um, yeah. And I always wonder what. So you went to you. You were, like, a good student in high school. I was a the kind of student where teachers always said you are very talented. You should apply yourself a little procrastinating, a little leaving it till the last minute. And that was not for the just the listeners. That was not Neil sighing. He opened a very carbonated beverage. 
Very extremely car. Twenty five episodes it. in, and you're you're doing. I didn't. Well, you did you see my shock when it? Oh, I was, <laughs> I was so freaked out. So, yeah, but I, you know, did well on things like well ish on things like the SATs, and I had a decent grade point average, and I wrote well. I had a lot of teachers who thought I was a good writer. And you were funny. I was funny, yeah. but I was sort of back of the class funny, not sure. front of the class funny. Yeah. I think there's a, a, I think anyone who goes to high school knows the difference in that. People that are front of the class funny are actually not funny. They are in their final years of funny. They, it's something Seinfeld said one time. He goes, when I was in high school, everyone was funny. And then they stopped and I kept going. Yeah. There is was no, it is this odd thing yes. where you're like, hey, aren't we going to keep doing this? And they're like, I got to get to whatever, work. I do think that's it. That if you don't actually go into a career of comedy starting after high school, and that includes, you know, you go to, which I did, you go to college and you start doing comedy in college. And, okay, and then so started, then you get into Northwestern. Go to Northwestern, think I want to be, I am a film major. I think I want to direct movies. First day of the first, film class that was about technical film stuff. But then I was like, oh, this is science. This is more, you know, and again, I realize now I was being, you know, petulant back then, but you know, you have to learn the science before you can make the art. And I right. was just so uninterested by it. But I it, had the same exact experience at yeah. NYU where I was like, fuck this. The I got to take a degree rule, that sort of stuff. Photo. I got to take pictures. Yeah. I got to do stills and like a radio play. And now I just read a, there was that New Yorker article with Bill Hader where he's talking about like different lenses they yeah. use for Barry. And you're like, oh, yeah, you were always like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think anybody gets over that hump. You either By the think way, I, I've been directing, I mean, I obviously famously directed your Netflix special. Bobby Baby directed Bobby by Baby, Neil of course, directed by Neil Brennan. But I've been directing 20 years and I just now, I swear to God, in the last, I taught, had a credible conversation about lenses. 10 days ago. Congrats. That's where a like, big, yeah. I was like talking to one of the great DPs, Malik Saeed, who did Clockers and he got game. And I was like, I literally was like, are we on a 50? Maybe can we go down to like a, like a 17? So it was pretty cool. Yeah. I would love one day to be able to say that. It's he not. was like, no, I said, are we, what are we on? I was like, is that a, and he's like, it's a 35. It's like, I, but let's go down. To seventeen, great. The, to um, have the confidence to say to just down. fucking say it. The uh, fish eye is a. I think fish eye is twelve. People are gonna in the comments are gonna fucking light me up. This is good. Oh, for this for getting it wrong for or, or just talking about it. In no, no, no. For not knowing what yeah. exactly is what. But but um, well, you have another podcast called Lenses. I and do. Like, Keep and it's, it on lenses. It's, Don't let blocks. You can't get into, believe how popular it is. And I've got one called Plants. I love. it. This is, I love it. I, for those who are only listening, there's a great deal of plants behind me. A huge and amount. None behind Neil. Like intent. Like like. Uh, like I asked for. It. Like it was in my rider that I wanted. This is a version of. There's a famous photo of me and Seth. Oh, um, where, it is a. It is a famous. It is version really of famous it. photo because I show it every time I'm on Seth's podcast or Seth's podcast, Seth's talk show. It's like a podcast, but with a budget. Yeah. And um, I'm spaced out because I'm slightly on the on the spectrum, and he is uh, charming a person. Yeah. And, and we're in the same shot we're in the at same a nightclub that has plants a on the wall. Yeah. N.A., I believe, was the name of that nightclub. N.A., yeah. a parody of Narcotics Anonymous. Yeah, I'm, that's I'm how better. they, that was the inside joke. That, okay. So, so college, and then I'm in college, and I like, I have a great time in college, and I see New Student Week, I see the Northwestern College Improv Troupe, and I just think, that's it. Now I know. That's what I want to be doing. I want to be on stage. I want to be coming up with funny things real fast. Procrastinator's you don't want to wait. dream. Yeah. yeah. You know, procrastinator's dream, no time. Impress people with the speed, and then you can figure out the quality later. Because so much of it, just when college kids are running. And also the celebrity. Like, oh my God, look at this. There, I'm sitting with 500 students, and we're paying attention to eight peers you know it wasn't right. like a travel it wasn't that second city came and did a show so i really wanted what to do you, that. what's it called why it's meow is the name of it. meow meow <laughs> meow is a parody of wamu <laughs> wamu is a, a was, i believe a hundred year old musical theater review that happened at northwestern Fuck. so meow was like 60s in the 60s i've been talking to some wavy gravy dudes who are writing a book about meow who 
keep wanting to ask me questions about my experience. Guys who I think were maybe the... They're uh, just going to have to chop this up. She started it. Yeah, they'll, this will be good. But I auditioned every year until I only got into the improv troupe my senior year. But I did take it seriously to the point where I started going to Chicago. Um, from Northwestern. From Northwestern. Northwestern. But from it was, you know... In Evanston. Which it's is, like an hour. It was no, uh, not, to get like there. It's like 40 minutes. Yeah, it was still subway. 40 minutes. Yeah, it's 40 minutes, but you got to watch the train. Blah, blah. Anyway, uh... I would take improv classes and and I really because for the purposes of making it being better at, at audition, IO you would take improv I would classes? take improv classes at IO yeah. Improv Olympic Improv right, Olympic good. is as it was called at the time now no longer um and and then my senior year I got on the improv troupe and it, it was uh I loved it so much it was everything I wanted it to be and I thought oh I want to do this so then if you're asking me what was my goal my goal was all right I'm going to graduate I'm going to stay in Chicago I'm gonna do Did you shows care about school? Were you like studying? Not enough. No. I care no. I never thought by the time I was in school, I never thought I was gonna get a job where my transcripts mattered. Great. But I cared about grades. I mean, it was not inexpensive for my parents to send me there and my report cards would go home. And so I th there was an expectation that I didn't want to have bad grades. But I, I can't also believe that I'm I haven't thought about report cards going yeah. like you're an adult yeah and you have a clear you that emotion is still in you like you don't want your parents to see your report card and you have do you do your kids have report cards yet no I did um for James Corden's last show they got all the late night hosts together to shoot a thing I don't know if you saw that sketch it turned out very well they did a very nice job and it was going, uh, they shot all the hosts together in one room and they were so fast because they knew they were asking for a yeah. time. And my dad was in town. This is two months ago. And it went a half hour over. And I said to Stephen Colbert, my, I'm meeting my dad for dinner tonight. And I'm so embarrassed by how stressed I am right now that I'm going to keep him waiting. Yeah. I am doing a real showbiz thing undeniable yes, like, i have nothing like, to apologize for yes and yet the fact that i am keeping my dad waiting at a meal that i will then pick up uh, the check for <laughs> and so yeah those things stay do you think that's healthy because i'm uh, i'm uh, like i still see my mom right. as an authority figure i still see my I would. I don't like cursing around my mom. I don't. You know what I mean. Like yeah. I don't like talking about sex around. I don't. There's just stuff. I'm like. I don't. I'm not. I would argue that's probably better than the opposite. What's the advantage of not? I should say at its core, it's one politeness. You know, I don't want to keep anybody waiting. But yeah, it's different that it's my dad. I would feel worse about keeping my dad waiting than almost anybody. Is that healthy? I would say. It's hard to make an argument that it's healthy. It I really? do. I think it's the right thing to do. And I guess the opposite is I'm standing there saying, oh, he'll understand, which I'm sure he would. But I'm saying, do you see your parents as a, you di are you fully on board as your parents or just to a couple people? Oh, no. I, I, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think of my parents as just a couple people. I have. Okay. I, they're, val they're I value pillars. them. Yeah. They're, they're psychological, emotional pillars of your life. Also, parents I, are like Greek gods in a but weird if, way. And I feel very in debt to my parents. My parents have been so, you know, supportive. Uh, you know, I mean, college was, you know, for me, I'm very happy to say the last time they supported me financially, but that was a huge amount of money for them back then. And then they were incredibly supportive of the choice I made to go into this business, which is, I mean, I think, I do feel like there's a new, there was this 20 year period where all of a sudden comedy was noble and a lot of, parents all of a sudden there was a generation of parents who grew up on snl and so they thought yeah. it was so cool their kids got on snl yeah whereas that didn't exist maybe before but they were super into it and you know they came to shows all the time when i was doing small shows and that meant a lot to me and so i feel in, in their debt and your your parents are funny your parents have like my your, parents are very both funny. of your parents have your weirdly your parents have in terms of like personality strengths they're one and two to me you and Josh are three and four. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. As like far as amplitude like amplitude of 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 personality, 
how well written a sitcom character they are, they're way better. You know exactly. Yeah. You want to write for them more than you want to write for Josh and I. <laughs> Which is but like, I feel like that almost never happens. Yeah. Where you just know, oh, I know exactly how. And they look like caricatures of themselves. They do. And they're, and they're, it's a really fun thing where is that, you know, the great thing about aging is you just become, you just lean into who you are. And yeah. Nobody makes some crazy like visual right turn. Yeah. Hi. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores, and pass those sweet savings directly onto you. I started using it. If you look up how these services work, it's actually great. They basically just use pre-existing wireless companies bandwidth. And of course, it's owned by my very good friend, Ryan Reynolds, who for all I know, uses Mint Mobile to ghost me because he ghosted me a few months back. Clearly, this is his recompense for ghosting me and he's nowhere near done. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash Neil. That's mintmobile.com slash Neil. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Neil. Ryan, I appreciate you giving me whatever I'm making for this from your, we up to a billion dollars yet? Close. Mid-mobile. Okay, so then you you get into the thing at Northwestern. Are you bet around the same as everybody? Do you have like- I think I'm better. Okay, I great. Do I'm think sure there's I'm, six people right now that are punching their- I mean, I would only say that they would, the thing that I'm not proud of, they would attest not that I was better. They would attest if you asked them on a lie detector that I thought I was better. Right. You know, this is not a, a surprise to them. And I will say, and it's a real, it was a real, ugh, when you are a little bit, when you have that arrogance when you are the best, or at least you think you're the best in a small group of people. Just know you're probably a couple group of people away, which for me, it wasn't that many moves to SNL for my college improv troupe. It was only, you know, five years. And now all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm the worst person here. And how is the best person here treating me? And would I be happy if they treated me the way I treated people in my college improv troupe? You know, I have some shame. Oh. You know what I mean? Where... So when you were sort of hot dogging it in Nor at Northwestern, I you know I think I hopefully was a uh, hot dogging it with some benevolence, but I do think it was hot dogging it. I do remember uh, my friend Pete Gross, who is a really accomplished writer yeah. who wrote for Late Night. He again, we were doing a rehearsal for Freeze Tag, no audience, just a rehearsal <laughs> and like an empty stage. And I remember somebody tagged me out before I said my joke and I threw my baseball cap against the wall. Now, one, the very fact that I'm wearing a baseball cap while I'm improvising is, is damning. But that, I ha I was very temperamental and, and I feel like my temperament, you know. Well, this is what I would say, the, you're me if I went to prep school. That's me. Yeah. Okay. That's throwing, a, I, I don't know. If, I threw a hat, whatever, but like fucking would absolutely. Yeah. I was a PA on the pilot for Singled Out on MTV and they wanted me to go pick up food and I was like, no, nah, yeah, not doing it. Like a fucking asshole. So when, did, cause, and then I remember somebody saying they'd gone to an SNL and they saw you before the show and you were yelling at somebody. I was like, that was him. At like you were yelling at a makeup you're yeah no, i don't know you're not i don't when did you stop yelling well people? i the best person i met professionally 
and continues to be that person is Mike Shoemaker. Yes, Mike producer. Shoemaker, who is ostensibly your partner. Yeah, uh, uh, executive producer of Late Night Now and uh, was a producer at SNL when I started there and a man of great benevolence. Mm-hmm. And he was very helpful in pointing out the ineffectiveness of you know, sudden bouts of anger at people who more often than not just didn't understand what it was you wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no, I ran into, which will surprise people, I ran into very little malice uh, at my time at SNL. And yet, you know, I I think it's a very high pressure system, obviously. And more often than not, you're angry at yourself and and, or, or angry at how you're being, the audience is responding to what you believed your best work was. But I did have some some bad moments. Did he ever say? Because I'm still I still lose my temper. I'm getting better at it. But that thing of it's not people just didn't understand. I get so frustrated because I told somebody the other day, this is like a lot of jobs are you're playing charades with people and you can talk. (laughs) Right, right. And people still don't understand. You're like, I'm talking, (laughs) I'm acting out, and you still didn't do the what I thought was obvious thing. It is that there are certain things where, to no fault of other people, it is easier to do than to have to explain it in a foolproof way. You know what I mean? It's just, oh, I can, I know how to explain this to make sure I get exactly what I want, but I also have done the math in my head, and I think it's faster just to do it myself. R- yes, but uh, but a lot of times we can't do it. You know what I've started doing recently? Drawing. Yeah. Just drawing out this here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This here. A drawing is good. This here, and it just makes it way easier. Um, but I, it's still very frustrating, and it's hard for me not to believe it's not personal. This was heartbreaking for me, and I think you'll find it very funny. I was driving the other day, because now I will say I am, uh, uh, which is both a success and a failure, all my losing of temper happens in domestic settings. with Great. Temper. Perfect. What a place. I'm great at work now. I'm really great. <laughs> No problems. You need a shoemaker. You need shoemaker in, at the at the house. Driving in home. the car, I've got Ash is in the back seat with his friend. And your oldest son, as seven years old. Axel's also there. Axel's five, being impossible, and I'm I'm getting into it with Axel. I'm trying to keep my cool, but it's not, you know. And Ash says to his friend, "Oh, this is going to be so funny. My dad's about to blow his top." Great, and it was just heartbreak you that thing where you i could not be less of a mystery to my children i'm whatever don draper was to his kids i'm the opposite of that (laughs) right but that's that sounds like progress to me meaning you're i don't know if you would have i never would have done a bit about my dad losing his temper like there were no bits yes when we were coming I up. don't, by the way, I don't think he was doing it as a bit for me. I, I don't think he was either. He genuinely just thought, this is hilarious. You'll want to. It's I, one of the nicest things. Yet when my dad got mad, I thought it was scary. Yeah. And I, when I get mad, my kids think it's funny, which is good. That's, That's great. progress. Yeah. That's it's just, fantastic. It, it's, uh, and I, by the way, get mad exactly the way my dad got mad, but it must, they, I feel like they're seeing it like an impression of somebody. You know, how do you, how do you get mad? I uh, just, it's hard to explain. <laughs> it just like run out of pain. I just feel as though I never just don't do a thing a person asked me to do five times. And I know it's just kids. They won't acknowledge you. Yeah. And I re- sometimes they're paying more attention to the thing they're doing. And, you know, their kid brain is needs to finish this thing before they can. It is important, right? It's not important to me that they're Lego, whatever thing they're doing. But it is important to them, and they have to. But I just, you know, I have to learn that the the correct path is not asking five times and then just being like, <laughs> you know, you know, then, <laughs> and that. do they then do it and laugh at you? They're like, it just uh, you just teach them the bad habit. You know what I mean? Like they. But if they think it's funny, you, I think it's positive. Don't. It's so funny because that thing is, my dad does have a temper. I definitely learned it from him. It was a very, I knew it to be a very ineffective parenting tool. And I feel like I tried very hard not to have it, but like, man, oh man, is it just like baked in. But also, 
Is it an ineffective parenting tool? I don't know. It's effective. It's, it's, I feel it, like it, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Gypsy Generation. Like, I do think it was effective. To it some depends degree. on what parent, what do you think parenting is? Right. Well, I guess parenting is if you need them to get in the car, right? Like, sometimes you have to get them in the car without doing anything that might be traumatic for them. You just, you have to have more patience than the five and the seven year old. That's all. Okay. But at the same time, there are times you got to get people in the car. Agreed. And <laughs> Seth, because he's a generous person, opened a water and he didn't want to, he didn't want me to still feel like a fool mm. from when I opened my water. Yeah. Still uh, being a key word here. I that's... mean, still people are, a lot of the viewers haven't gotten over it. What, but what do you think? I don't think parenting should be violent. I don't think, but sometimes it's like if you're being aggravated, I don't think that's a horrible lesson to learn. If I'm a child, if I don't acknowledge somebody and won't do what I'm very reasonably being asked to do by someone who loves me to just like a little bit of like, Hurrah! yeah, pick them up, move them. There are times where your kids make you feel like whatever a cuck is supposed to be. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of cuck stuff where happening. you just, especially when it's in public and you either lose all your, you, you crap out of the casino if you yell at your kid in a cafe, right? Like nobody cares how bad it was. You just are the loser. Yep. And so then the other version is just using this really ineffective calm voice mm -hmm. and you just, that's when you, it's the worst. Cucks, right? cucks for kids. Cucks for kids. Kid cucks. <laughs> Uh, and one eight seven <laughs> kids. Cucks for kids. Um, okay, so you got more patient at work, yeah, and and then kids seem like the worst coworkers imaginable, yeah, and, and you've then I think, and, it, and you've had to, yeah. And the that thing out. about work is, work sort of stays the same, and you mature and learn. Whereas with kids, I think they also are maturing. You, they're not a constant like work can be. So they're a con as you're learning how to deal with them as each level, they're oh yeah, that's an, that's not me anymore. That's do you old. are they getting do they get better? They're getting better. But the weird thing is my little girl who's not yet too best of all. You of know? course. And I mean again, you know, ticking time bomb, I'm sure, but right now I dream had through. a joke that didn't really work one time. I was like when I was ten like little girls could solve the Middle East if they like, you know yeah. what I mean? But I like when I was 10, I had a babysitter. She was six. <laughs> like girl, little girl, they can, they just like she you was, over here, you here. Ha, ha, ha. We uh, were having breakfast the other morning. I'm feeding ass. There's no greater, mor greater moral authority than a six year old girl, yeah. than a, the, or a two year old, any little girl. Um, wait, a six year old, we were at a party. She must, I want to start for the podcast audience by saying she must have heard this from someone, but this is something a six-year-old said. This is bad writing in a movie because I appreciate this is not how a six-year-old normally talks. Yes. There was a bouncy house at a Memorial Day party, and in the beginning it was all sort of five, six, seven-year-olds, and then the teenagers showed up and went in, and it was, um, the it, kids were coming out crying because it was just got too rough. Yeah. And I saw a six-year-old girl say, um, it's turned into the devil's playground. Bad writing in a movie, you'd say that's It's a cutaway and a, it's turned into a devil's playground yeah, for the trailer. We love it. it for the trailer. We love but, it for the trailer. But in real life, it's in real not life, believable. Yeah, if it was, uh, yeah, you'd never get it past a, um, a neorealist filmmaker. Of course not. Not the sort of film students we were. Yeah. Um, okay, and... What I'm interested in you and the in the thing that you don't talk about very much is the going from toward the end of SNL yeah. cast member Seth. Yes. In that incredibly fast heat of other Well, yeah. So to go back to echo back to what you were saying earlier. So that was the real the gnarliest time for me after my first year, Forte and and Fred joined the cast. I mean, two of the most unique comedy voices of the last 20 years because there were things that were happening at SNL before this is they six? showed up. No, still we're talking 02. Okay. They show up. 
there's that thing of I'm looking around and I'm sort of watching what everybody's doing and I'm thinking I can get there, you know, not throwing any shade on anybody that was happening. But I felt like, again, it was all the versions of the sketch comedy I'd grown up for. A year before I was watching SNL, I got it. Now I'm on SNL, I'm seeing it up close. Jimmy and Tracy have moves. Will, like comedy, fun, yeah. fucking hilarious dudes, funny, uh, with moves. Will Ferrell, kind of outer space. You, outer, you, you don't can't even get think, there. right. And you nor do you, there. Yeah. never in my, I never thought, Okay, that's next. Yeah. And then and then step. Tina ABC. and Amy, hilarious moves, like fairly yeah. linear. Anybody who comes out of Chicago, you sort of feel like, you know, because again, that was so I'd seen Tina and Amy, I'd seen their growth because I used yep. to see them on stage and I'm like, okay, so growth will happen for me too. But then Forte and Fred show up and both they from have, outer space. Both from outer space, bag of tricks you've never seen before. No overlap with what either of them has that just, oh, so now. You know, it spent that whole summer being like, I'm going to get a little bit better. And I'm like, oh, now it's a daze. Then there's like, you know, and so then I kind of, uh, you know, get through that and and they kind of find their space and I have mine. But then now this other thing happened, which is Andy, Bill, and pretty soon after uh, Sudeikis. Sudeikis, who had been a writer. Who had been a writer. He joins the cast a little bit, if my timeline's right, a little bit after Bill and Andy, or maybe at the same time. But they're, I think they maybe are all at the same time. So now there's like five guys. And I'm writing at the time as well. And I just sit down and I don't feel like I am self-hating. I like the things I'm good at. But I would write sketches and I would have an idea for a premise. And I would genuinely think if, I want this to work, and I have these six guys of which I'm counting myself, um, and I want this sketch to work. As a writer, my f- sixth choice is Seth. You know, if I'm Sam, and I'm gen- like, and I'm not like, Ugh. no, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't think anyone would disagree with you. Yeah, I mean, I. You would say if it's if it's a fail safe joke where someone has to say the word without stumbling, Seth can do it. But every right. one of them brings these other layers, which yeah. is what any sketch writer any writer anywhere wants which is i think i wrote this great thing but now i want to bring in a performer who is going to make it great in seven different granular ways that is going to somehow make that it i can't predict and i can't write can't predict, it yeah and, I mean, and also just like with some of them it's just andy's charisma bill's charisma yeah uh uh sadekis fucking charisma yes out the yin yang the other thing is so now you're like oh not only do you feel like right away, oh, they're all better than me. The longer you're with them, you now want to write for them based on moves you've seen them do. Yeah. Because the longer you're with Andy, the more you want to write for Andy. The longer you're with Keenan to bring up somebody yeah. who hasn't mentioned. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention. The more you want to write for Keenan. And... And yet I'm with myself every day and I'm not giving myself a single new idea. At no <laughs> point in my life. Well, now, but here's something only Mr. Myers can bring. To and I, we're fast forwarding, but Andy suggested you do really. Really? When right? I auditioned, yeah. When I auditioned for Weekend Update, Sandberg, gift of gifts, said you should do something called really because that is the cadence you talk in and I think it's really funny. And so and, I, and there are people who say that the cadence it's a we don't need it it's fine i think for the cadence cops are going to be watching this one i've been trying to <laughs> lean out of my neil cadence today but do you know the real burn on really though it was not you do you know oh no yeah this all right so basically what i'm getting at is seth has said he's doing me when he does really you said that to jerry seinfeld no it was di- the seinfeld was not it was independent of you seinfeld okay. we heard seinfeld wanted to do something on the show he was promoting, I don't remember if it was, let's say B movie, B, yeah. he wants to come on update. And I I had never spoken to Jerry Seinfeld at this point, but we get on the phone and we had decided, oh, maybe Jerry would be fun to do a really with. Yeah. And I said, uh, we have this thing called really. He goes, oh, I know really, I like really. And I was like, we think you'd be really good at it. And he said, some might say I invented it, <laughs> which is so, it yep. was to hear it and realize. Yep. Yeah. It's a great thing about Jerry Seinfeld <laughs> is he sounds like Jerry Seinfeld. He sounds like Jerry Seinfeld. And it was 
it was like he said, I can see dead people because it everything when he I'm like, of course. Uh, yeah. Re, of and then course if, I've even been, when you say Chappelle was like, isn't that isn't really yours? He said that to me independently. Yeah. And I probably just got it from Jerry. Right. Like, but I don't it's, not. It talk was about very it. at least you weren't in this situation where you were where I had. To I talk talked to, Jerry to the directly. first guy yeah, yeah, yeah. and I brought it up like it was a thing. Yeah. I like, did. well, <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. It was like call, saying to LeBron, like, and then we dunks. We sometimes yeah. do dunks. There's a corner three, the left <laughs> corner three. Have you ever shot a left corner three? Do you like dunks? So you feel like you're kind of getting washed away. And you don't even, you can't even really argue with it. You can't really argue with it. You can't stop the tide. Mm -hmm. The uh, solution at the time would be a some negative for the franchise which is things would be going better for me if all of them were worse you know what i mean like the right, only you know, way and, right because you like them all i i like them all i At like when the like, show's good i mostly love them all no they're all family all, yeah i mean everybody we've talked about you included we're at oh. my wedding these are people you know what i mean and and uh and i'm glad they were and they i love them they are uh I mean, not to get Vin Diesel on you, but they were like family, more than friends at some point because you just spend so much time together yeah. at SNL. And then I hated myself for... Competing with them and, or, or and, whatever. Yeah, it's just, just like the, the jealousy unfortunate, I hated. Yeah. I hated that when they would crush, it was impossible to remove that piece of me that was saying, Ugh, well, there's another strike against me, even though yeah. it wasn't. A strike against me, except of course it was, right? There is a calculus at the end of every season of SNL where the decision makers say, you know, what do we need? Do we need this or is this a redundancy? Can you belly? explain that summer? Yeah. And what the summer, it's 07? 06. It's 06. It's 06. Yeah. Summer of 06. Explain to the earth what happened. And I'll explain what it was like to watch. Well, Tina has left mm -hmm. to go. First, she left to have a baby, and then she left for 30 Rock. And her. And this is how dumb show business is. Tina goes to do this show, a pilot for 30 Rock. Aaron Sorkin did his show called Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, yeah. which was a drama, an hour drama about Saturday Night Live. And none of us knew which was going to be more successful. Like, looking back, you're like, what? I know. But 30 Rock versus to... Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. And we were all like, I don't know. I don't know. You know, maybe people do want to see a drama about it. Both on NBC. Both on it. Yes. Anyway, I had the my last year working with Tina, I had been made a writing supervisor. So I was not a writer on the show. You and were not, or you no, were just a cast member. I was hired member. as a cast member, and I, I'm very proud of the fact that during my struggles as a cast member, I did write enough things that Lauren thought I would be good at sort of running a table and being a head writer. Being a head writer. I wasn't a head writer yet, but then Tina left. And I remember Tina used to, if she couldn't rewrite her sketches, she would send them to you. Yes. We had a nice, that last year was a really nice. For me to know that she valued uh, yeah. my opinion as a writer. But you were sixth in terms of who she would cast. I, yeah, but we had the same six. <laughs> uh -huh. We had the same six. So I, we come back in the fall for SNL. We do these sort of uh, dicking around re weeks uh, writing commercial parodies. I don't, don't know if they do that anymore in the same uh, way that we used to. I used to say it would take, it'd take 24 people seven weeks to write three commercial parodies. Insane. It was the biggest waste of money. It was like a, it was like city government waste of money. And it proves anytime somebody says, you know, I don't understand why SNL doesn't work all year round to like bank sketches. Doesn't work. It just doesn't. Like really, the, the sketches well, the, are shitty. Well, They're no, just that's, shittier. but that's what I mean. Like the commercial parody, like the best commercial parodies on an SL season are very rarely the ones that were written in yeah. all, late August. Yeah, I don't course. know why. Yeah, yeah. It's just there's something immediate. It's about almost like necessity is the mother of invention. There you go. Coin it. So. They are having auditions to replace Tina. They had auditions to replace Jimmy. I had auditioned for that when that had been three years ago. I obviously wanted this a great deal. Amy and, got it that time. Yeah, Amy got it that time, which made all the sense in the world. And then I was auditioning for it. Who's auditioning for it? I won't. Uh, okay. 
I won't remember everybody. But, but like seven people, six, yeah. five to seven. And some are, I remember Sudeikis, you. Keenan, a uh, couple writers, maybe some people from the outside. And they, but beforehand, I also know I'm going to be head writer next year. I'm very proud of. But you're, you're performing, your cast contract I'm, is up. My cast contract is up, and basically I get word from my manager, which is, hey, next year, you'll either get update, but if you don't get update, they'd like you to just be a writer. So you would just be the head writer of Saturday Night Live. You would never be on the show. I would never be on camera anymore as the head yes. writer for SNL. And it's the only time I ever, I think to this day, have done something like this, but I said no. Basically, they wanted, as I recall... They wanted you to sign a contract saying, I'll audition for Weekend Update, and if I don't get it, I will be head writer and I will not be on the show. Yes. And to which you said... I just said no. I said, I'll, yeah. I'm not going to sign the contract till after you decide about Weekend Update. Yes. So basically, they... Not strong arm, but like they were trying to go like, hey, we're, they were kind of holding one ab against the other. Sure. Like, And by the way, I didn't as evidenced by the fact that I then, as soon as I got update, I was never in another sketch. Later on, people started putting me in sort of derisively, like I'd be as a as a gag. As, as a, it would be go, a like, gag. Can you imagine, then like Seth, like <laughs> me, I was like Boston, Boston talent. Powers. I think is like the next time. Do you remember the Kings of Catchphrase Comedy? The Kings of Catchphrase Comedy Tour is back. I can't believe I don't. Cause it's, it's a really, really good sketch. I it's I Bobby do. Moynihan it's got a and, scroll, right? David Beef Jelly Wingfield. Beef Jelly. It's got yeah, like, yeah, it's a bunch of. It's just Kings of Cat, and I was yeah. Boston Powers. Uh, Christine Angle. And, and what was your what was your catchphrase? Like I don't know. Do you do you think I'm a sexy? I don't know. It was some version of Boston Masshole right. and Austin Powers. Yeah. I can't believe it. I don't remember. So uh, tell me, do you want to shag now or shag later? I see. This is why they don't put me in sketches. So I can't. Yeah, even, can't I can't remember. Even, I can't even do you, PR they give you catchphrases. I can't, can't even do it. I can't even do publicity. So yeah. So I basically just. Uh, and I will say, I because I, I I mean everything. You I, were you would have rather quit than just be head writer because yeah. out of like not pride but like pro uh, pride. Pride. Some pride. And also this. I meant what I said. I did think I was the sixth of that list. Yeah. And then if you add in, I mean, I'm sure, by the well, way. Well, that's I'm, the thing. We haven't even talked about polar, wig. Wig, Maya. I right. mean, fucking murderers. There, there is a photo on the wall of the office that I still work at on the eighth floor where it's, we had an 11-person cast. Nine of us have hosted Keenan's still on the show yeah. and Daryl Hammond is the announcer. So yeah. that's the 11. That was that time. Yeah. And it's the best. I would put it up against any era. I remember you show. saying that like 15 years ago, I'm kind of rolling my eyes in my head, yeah. but like, mm. and it was just lean and mean and everybody yeah. could do anything. And I would always, it is one of the great benefits of being a part of a smaller cast is that Andy Samberg, you know, a self professed doof, has to do political impressions because you just run out of bodies <laughs> and it's fun. Like and the audience likes it because they know it's, they know everything when the dick in a box guy is all of a sudden, you know, Rahm Emanuel, they think that's awesome. So my point is I didn't think I should be a cast member. I did think I should do weekend update with Amy. I did in my heart yeah. in my bones. I, it was the one thing where I thought this, you, if, you and by the way, I think if they'd picked other people, it would have been fine. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it would have been any disaster, but I did think, hey, no, you, I, I get it. I have not been uh, the best at this. That's why when I write sketches, I don't put myself in it. That's why, yeah, I, you no, know, guys. It was, it was. and then, uh, but I was like, I did, I, I, the pride part was not just, I can't work here if I don't have that job. The pride was, I can't sign this piece of paper and make their decision. Yeah, any easier. like basically, they were, they were ready to like. And they, I remember my recollection is there were, they weren't dying for you to host update. I think there was, you know, some people thought I'd be better at it. Someone, I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever dying for, any, for I mean, anybody. Lauren, Lauren is not like, I think that no one's ever like, Lauren's dying for anything or yeah. anyone. So mm. it's time for Paul McCartney to call, call him back. Yeah. But like, that's it. 
Exactly. And he did. And he would never, he would never show it he to would Sir Paul. Ever, ever, ever. Well, it's about time. No, it, oh, oh look who it sitting is. sitting by the phone. Look who it is, Mop um, Top. So, yeah, and that was a... So uh, you basically had to gamble on yourself. Yeah. I remember it being like a risky... It was one of these moments in someone's life where I felt like, boy, this is a hinge moment. Yeah. You auditioned. You auditioned for update and you were either going to get update or you were leaving SNL. Yeah. I also then I auditioned for update. I went back to my dressing room. I put on running clothes and I uh, was going to go for a 10 mile run. And I ran into Central Park and I went like three miles and was like, fuck this. I'm ah." Because I was just like two. I thought like I could run the stress yeah. away and it just, it was like he's eating me up. And what did you, and then what I just like went back to my apartment and I think like ordered Chinese food and just stewed. Yeah, I remember that um, apartment. I can always remember the date I found out. I was at, do you remember there was a bar called C4? It was like on 48th. It was like, it was like catered to NBC employees. They had like a mural with like Al Roker on the wall. And uh, I was sitting at the bar there. Why were you up there? If you, because at this point, you're we like, shooting, I don't know if I work here we anymore. We were shooting the opening credits and, uh, and they were, so they still hadn't decided, but like were had, you gonna, I, were they were going to shoot me in the opening credits just in case, I guess. Uh, and then I was sitting at the bar with Shoemaker or maybe I was sitting at the bar and Shoemaker came over and told me, but I remember the date. I can always look it up because the Steelers were playing on Monday Night Football against the Who Dutch can Florida. forget who can forget it's that? It's the only time the Steelers have ever played on Monday Night Football. Well, you know, when you know the years. And it turned out that I was right. Like, the, I I thought, like, if I got that piece, things would be okay at SNL. And that was the beginning of things being For okay. you. Yeah. I got to be uh, on Weekend Update, which was the the place I always thought I'd fit best there. Got to do it with Polar, the person. And I got to be, re- I, it turned me into a really good head writer. Because I was uh, absolutely uh, then selfless about that element of the show because I, well, there was no I took myself out of the competition from either for from winning or losing as a sketch player and I just it like the better the sketches were uh the better the show was the better people thought I was doing as head writer so I it was great it made me better at both and it was the best I had the best time once I started doing update it took I mean again I remember once do you remember Sandberg had a sketch called that'll move the chains <laughs> So I, I don't. It was some version. It, it makes was, me laugh as a as like an idea for a down, sketch. It was originally a Make a Wish kid, but then you know, uh, you know, uh, cooler minds prevailed, and that was like don't have a. And so it was he was some kid who got to go to the booth for a game, and every play he would go that'll move the chains, and like at first the yeah. the announcers think it's it's cute, and then it's and uh, he did it, it went well. And then, like, eight weeks later, he comes into my office. And I'm like, what are you working on tonight? He goes, we're thinking about writing another That'll Move the Chains. And I, now, and probably you, thought that was a one-off premise mm-hmm. and not a recurring character. Mm-hmm. So he said, I think we're going to write another That'll Move the Chains. And I just said, another? And he went, hey, not all of us have fucking update every week. And it was, I mean, that was the truth of it, though, yeah. right? Like, when you don't have update every week, like, sometimes you just hit the fucking wall and you're like, I guess we'll do another That'll Move the Chains. But, like, I got to... <laughs> It was just flying high. It was Doing the best another game. that'll move the chains is his version of moving the chains. You know what I mean? It's like the yes. uh, the levels. Yeah, right, exactly. Levels are fantastic. Again, let, let me stress when we're talking about actual geniuses. Uh, uh, there's another Sandberg goes in that box immediately. Yeah. Uh, a, a PhD in sophomore comedy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I love Lonely Island as much as I love Radiohead. Yeah. Like I love they. I know all their songs. I know. I know. I, they're like. I'm I a, when I see Instagram videos of friends of mine who have brought their kids to see Taylor Swift, and it's just they're losing their mind. That's maybe not like how I physically projected it, but it is absolutely internally how I felt when I watched the Lonely Island concert live. Like yep. when they went on tour, and I yep. got. We went and saw we went them in Minneapolis. the night before your show or the night after your show. The night after. It was even better. Yeah. It was like yes. the great, yes. one of the Pressure best 24 off. hours of my life was when we, uh, you directed my special in Minneapolis yep. and then we went and watched those dudes. And I opened for them and did fine. It was great. Hey, uh, you know how buying tickets is a humiliating nightmare and you're giving them money. So why, why are they making it stressful? Game time 
is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped over the person you're going to bring with you and how they're going to be. Are they going to give you the sort of attention you like? And will it result in sex? Will it be safe or unsafe? I've used the app. I got tickets for the L.A. Philharmonic. Uh, it was easy. It was like, it was what you want. It was just buttons, and it wasn't like, whoa. They have images of seat views, which I like as an or artist. I get to see what, how people are going to see me, and I think about uh, turning. It's also really good for last-minute tickets. You don't have to worry about, you know, I see I'm doing a, I'm doing shows in New York, Philly, and Boston this week, and I can see who the last minute people are. It's funny to me. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code B L O C K S for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code B L O C K S for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. How did you figure out what you were good at? And was there a level of embarrassment? Meaning we both sort of become who we always were. You just figure it out. You just go like, oh, no, okay, I'm not that. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm not that. I, like, what was it like for you? I think I weirdly, I did work through a fairly supportive era at SNL. With that said, when you took a big swing at the table outside of your comfort zone, like there was no, you could feel it. You could feel the air of that miss and uh, flop. I mean, I flop sweated in a conference room, just reading sketches for my with peers. in front of Amy yeah. Poehler, Kristen Wiig, Keenan, right. Andy, Bill, just Sudeikis. and 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 especially it is a thing where you just start pressing. Right? It's not to keep going back to like sports analogy. Jeez, but like when you're in a slump and you're just trying anything and then nobody wants to be around you because it's your slump vibe is so sweaty and yeah. you, they're irrationally worried it's contagious. I remember maybe my second year, there was some MTV dance show and I'm not going to remember the name of the guy I played, but Matt Murray is a great writer. We were office mates, and I... His nickname was Panther. Matt, His nickname yeah. was Panther because uh, I believe Polar coined it because she said, you're in the room for two minutes before anyone realizes you are Yeah, like a panther. It's a great nickname. It's a great nickname. Uh, he, I would also... I've been meaning to mention that 40% of the time I refer to you, I refer to you as Snarf. Yeah. And the reason is because... Kristen Wiig did an update as Bjork. Yeah. And was like, Greeting Snarf. Snarf. <laughs> I was like, Well, there it is. There it is. Perfect. Snarf. The many gifts of how update characters said my name uh, is one of the. The um, Sarah Schneider and Chris Kelly, who wrote Olga Pavlotsky, which was a late, my late era of, of Weekend Update, it was uh, Kate McKinnon's Russian. Yep. And she always called me Set Meyer. Set. And they made me a nameplate that I have in my office that says Set Meyer. And it's just a yes. very funny joke to yes. give somebody a bad nameplate. And I'll, it's a great, and it because it's a nationally televised joke. Yeah. And you can either keep it or not. <laughs> That's that joke. That is a bear with me. Let me tell you about my dream house, Set. Okay, sure. Bear with me. I am. No, in my dream house, I have a bear with me. Okay. <laughs> And <laughs> the um, uh, and Chris Kelly and Sarah Schneider created uh, the other two. The, other the, two. the, the hit, wonderful the show. Hit. The wait, I was talking. Oh, so this dance scene, and I think so. Panther was doing me a favor. He put me in this scene where I was the lead of a scene. I was introducing, it, but I was this dance guy, and uh, it was uh, it was bad. It was a bad sketch, but it aired. But it was bad, and part of the reason it was bad is I can't really dance, and that was. Uh, that was a, I remember your calves were on one time on TV. That was funny to me. Was, yeah. Something about that was just funny. Like seeing you in shorts on TV was funny. 
And I remember Steve Higgins, who's still a producer of the show, dear friend Steve Higgins. And I realized Big it took bones, me like the great Higgins. What's that? Higgins. Big bones, yeah. Like five it took me five years to realize what he was telling me. But I remember he was like, Don't do sketches like that. Like don't <laughs> like he was basically like, it's not you have to know you can't do that. You have the great story about writing an Australian accent for who? Martin Short. Oh. Wait, did I which was the which You was, wrote a sketch for Martin Short. Yeah. And and he was like, I don't do an Australian accent. And you were like, You're fucking Martin Short. Of course you do. And he's like, and then you realize like, oh, I we have to manage what we do in public because we'll look stupid if we can't do it. Oh, yeah, right. Like, Martin Short is smart enough to know, like, this. Is, I'm too late in the game here to not. Yeah, I'd know. I'm 68. I would know if I can do an Australian accent yeah. by now. There was another time that same week where he said, how do you want me to do this sketch? And I remember all I wanted to say was, like Martin Short. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I, this, I want you to know this all comes from my great reverence for you. Yeah. But like, we don't want to. We don't want to say anything that might mess up you doing it. Yeah, I like don't, just, you. Don't even pre- like I'm not here. Yeah. do it like I'm not here. Uh, the funniest person, Martin Troy, the funniest person I've ever been at a dinner party with, uh, by far. Um, and I haven't been to many dinner parties in my life. You, but uh, most of them are <laughs> like there's a there. You're on. You're the sixth invite. You're the sixth man. Oh, yeah. On... Sixth man. The great gift, if you invite me to a dinner party, I will remember the five funniest things that was that were said by other people and quote them the rest of my and life. And usually it's at a dinner party that Martin Short, Steve Martin, Lorne. Yeah. Mulaney. Uh, Mulaney. Seinfeld. Seinfeld will be at there's a at these dinner parties. Oh, I think there's more of them than I'm at, but every now and then. No, like I know because I've heard the ones that you're not at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because sometimes rock will spell you. Right. They'll, I think we the, the rotation they, they if have they're trying a, to diversify it, they'll yeah, bring yeah, yeah. It, they'll take you out. Um, oh, the other one that was very in line with the Martin shirt was uh, I know I told you this as well, which is Elton John when Elton John hosted. It was Wednesday. And so all the sketches had been written and Elton John was reading through the sketches for the first time. And I sort of got called to go talk to him. And it should be noted, he was an excellent host. He was very funny. He was great. But I think I saw a thing. He was very funny and almost didn't know why. I got to see a thing that like nobody, I feel, sees, which is I went in and he was definitely like you know it's 40 sketches if you don't do sketches <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's 40 we got 40 for 40, you 40 and gonna then you're try. gonna read them in front of people and i just i realized i was with a guy who due to his talent and work ethic hadn't even come close to bombing in 45 years yeah you know and uh, all of in a sudden, any setting in any setting and when you look at 40 sketches and you realize at no point do you get to do rocket man and no you know it's just and it was so that is a real and the other funny thing is it's at snl it's a it's a cramped so you're just in a tiny room yeah with elton john the elton john and he's a little panicked right and there's nowhere there's n- yeah, there's no uh a uh, room. He can't say give me a minute and go into a bigger room <laughs> where he goes when when the hoi His polloi. freakout room. Yeah. Yeah, there's no and so uh though and that is one of the uh I don't know, I feel like sometimes we we fail to appreciate exactly the ask of the SNL host because it's a massive Well, it was also fun. I remember either Tom Brady, I think Tom Brady hosted or it's sort of countering what you're saying, but he, I think on Friday or Saturday, you go, are you nervous? And he was like, no. <laughs> yeah. And you were like, oh yeah, I guess you do have an ambulance at your work. Yeah. Like you might die right. if things, if you bomb. Well, also, you know, no one, I do feel you could bomb as an athlete and it wouldn't cost you anything in the sports world. You know what I mean? It's not like yeah. You know we're gonna oh you you're can gonna bomb practice at, on SNL. Yeah, you like, well, like we you still you've you're lost, still you're still the first room. team. <laughs> yeah. You're still yeah like well this <laughs> the, is gonna affect your, don't trust your you Pro anymore. Bowl nomination. Well, we're gonna have to take your 
that your your yeah, uh, we can't do it. That second sketch you done a lot. So you bombed, and oh yeah, I bombed. In well, that what sketch. made you not? What made you not give up? But but you were. You, I guess pride kicks in, and then you were like, I think I'm good. Aren't yeah, I good. Well, you know, again, I should note that even in the worst of times, it was pretty fun working on SNL and living in New York City. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, for the any jealousy I had, I don't think it manifested itself in a negative way for the people I felt it towards. You know, I think that we, you know, I did, I was building friendships at the same time. And so it was wanting to stick around, right? Like it wasn't until that inflection point where I basically thought, well, I don't know. You know, if I had left, then it would have been seven years on the show or whatever, six years on the show. It wouldn't have been. A, a, I well, no, I remember and going like, hey, what do you, if you don't get update, what are you going to, are you going to move yeah. to LA? And you were like, I think so. Yeah. I don't, it's was, weird. I mean, I feel like I've wiped it all from my. I remembered that you did run all the way. You told me yeah. that you ran the full 10 Maybe miles. Maybe now. And was... when you told me that you got it, I straight up cried because <sighs> I was so excited for you. That is, and I should stress that um, one of the things about our friendship is there's so few people, you're one of them, Shoemaker's one of them, who know exactly what certain things meant to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas no fault to my parent, right? Like I... All, I had had all the conversations with you in the lead up to it, right? You knew all the pieces. I did not share any of that with my parents about mm. my anxieties or how I felt. Or I did. The, I did. You know, Go like, ahead. Because I remember walking out of uh, of that bar after I found out and calling my parents to tell them I was on Weekend Update. In my head, I'm like, this is, what What can I ever tell them that it's going to be bigger? Second to calling them to say I got on SNL. Right. And I was like, hey, I'm going to be... Uh, uh, I'm not going to do like as a like uh, here comes the bad news but here's the good news I'm like I'm not going to be in sketches anymore but I am the new anchor of Weekend Update and my mom was like you're not going to do sketches anymore and I was like Ugh. and then it was like not her fault right yeah. I just like I it, yeah. and, but that's why in life it's so good to have a friend like you where I could just give you the information and you I didn't have to explain like and why here's why it's great yeah you yeah, just, yeah. You, just uh, you just knew I'm in show business. Your parents are not. Yeah. But there's plenty of people in show business who don't get it. Right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I was just, it was, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared. Not, not like scared, but I was like, I didn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't an auto, it wasn't a gimme. It wasn't, they weren't giving it to you. No. And they weren't, the competition was pretty significant. Yes. Not even like, Fuck that. It was just like, oh, he's good. They're good. Well, like, that was always the problem at SNL was knowing that there weren't the second choice wasn't a wrong choice. Yeah. You know, it was uh, and you could probably go five choices deep before you would you would make them one. But they get sixth and there you are. Myers. What's that? <laughs> Myers gets to be a frustrated waiter. <laughs> um. And then Correspondence Dinner, another great night. I should, real quick, I'll get to care because I love, that is a great night. Um, uh, we used to joke that there would be photos from popular sketches on the wall at SNL. And there were like six of them where I was just a guy, while someone was crushing, I was a guy sitting on a counter in the background, like going like this. <laughs> just like yeah, that. I remember you and I talked about sketches one time and I, and I said, yeah, you don't want to be the guy in the sketch who says, you're driving me crazy. Yeah. That means you're not getting laughs. Yeah. You're a straight man. You're a straight man. I mean, it's nicer when you have a late night show because then you just, like, the, you're by design, you're the straight man. Or right. like Update Desk, but in sketches, it's bad. Well, Update, another hilarious thing about Update, which was uh, that Update, especially when you were host, probably forever, but... It was the last, it was the last court of appeals yeah. for crazy people. Yeah. Like, Seth, so then, <laughs> Mr. Myers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I think you said, you made me laugh once just talking about it, like Stefan in the green room before going on update and the idea that like a, a segment producer was like, and now you do have St. Patrick's Day tips this time because it has 
gone off the rails a lot. And yeah, Stefan's no. swearing to them. So you know what? I, I, I know I'm prepared <laughs> and I know what I'm going to say and I'm going to get out there. And then, <laughs> and then it just is like, wait, what? Yeah. Uh, another great guy. Alex Bayes made me a, a, a doormat that said, I'm going to stop you right there. Because that was a, if I had a catchphrase and we could update it. it I like, would like I, to just pause the uh, podcast right here to salute Bayes. Greatest living joke writer in America. I said it, I've said it on here before. Yeah. He wrote, uh, he wrote. Like a supermodel's vagina. Let's all give a warm welcome to Leonardo DiCaprio. And he also wrote one of my favorite jokes ever for you, for the correspondence dinner. Donald Trump said recently he has a great relationship with the blacks. Though unless the blacks are a family of white people, I bet he's mistaken. <laughs> uh, and that's just. Two out of, he also wrote the Black Eyed Peas are doing a free concert in Central Park. Uh, a free concert in Central Park, the Black Eyed Peas. That sounds too true to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Those are three out of legitimately a thousand incredible jokes the guy's written. I mean, again, a banger a day, easy, sometimes three. Mm -hmm. A day. A day. And when he writes I, closer look, you, him. Sal writes, I want to make sure Sal Gentile also shout out, writes yep. the first draft, and then Bayes and I come in and, and put in a few jokes. But that waiting for the Bayes draft on anything is so exciting because it's just he writes in like blue as you just scroll through like a 30 page document and there's four blues and he's just like, send them to cards. <laughs> he, when I left SNO, I got late night. I went into Lauren's office and, uh, he said, you can't have bass. And I said, I only, I'm only taking bass. But it was very, uh, I mean, I think that is the highest tribute you can get as a writer. I right, can't uh, believe we said Lauren's not desperate for anyone. And then, but Lauren literally said, you can't have bass. And then Lauren did a very funny bit, which is he kept naming his least favorite writers at the time and telling me I could have them. Which was, I thought was beyond him. Give me some of the names. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it was, I can't believe he knew their names. I, I, because I will say, like when Lauren is dismissive of a writer, it feels it's like, like they die, and it's like, oh no, you look at that. You, you yeah. this bit only worked if you knew that. No, actually, writer. it's worse for them than they know. Yeah. And he was like, I've already told them, so they're it's on that you you they start on Monday. Uh, yeah, but correspondence dinner base with a, a key player there. Yep, you were there. Yep. No, I get. Are you going to give me the key player designation? Key player. We had a bunch of us. John it Mulaney, was, uh, key Mulaney. player? Will you give him a key player designation? Mulaney was a key player. Mulaney wrote one of my favorite jokes you didn't do. Won't age well. We were, it was when drones first became known. Yeah. Obama uses drones. Uh, uh, if you don't know what drones are, drones are the street gang that Joe Lieberman was a member of in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> Some variation on that. The drones. Um. That was a very uh, that was a very special time. We worked very hard on that. Yes. Well, that's what I want to say about you, which is for for a former procrastinator, if anybody ever even insinuates anything negative about you, I am. It's like you want to talk about fucking values. You want to talk about comedy values. You, you fucking write your ass off, and you wrote. Uh, I can see Russia from my house. You wrote like. The f you wrote a lot of famous sketches, and that's just as a writer, plus all the shit you've done, Correspondence Center, how many episodes of uh, whatever, a thousand? 1,400 plus. Yeah. The Golden Globes, I was very happy with the Golden, Golden Globes. Glo yeah, Golden Globes. SBs, Glo we had a SBs, grand had old a, time. You know, wait. there was a time where the SBs was a, a really fucking kick-ass award show to do. It was fun. It, yeah. We got to do sketches. Yeah, that's the only time you've ever gotten mad at me. Was I direct some promos? They we couldn't do it a certain way. You didn't know that you got mad at me because I didn't you tell you. It was a thing about moving, <laughs> moving the moving the chains. It was a, it's something the script changed, and I like just I didn't tell, tell you, and you were mad. I get. I should say the the time where I'm, I get uh, most likely to be mad is like out of my element where I have to perform. Right. You know, where I have to like be on camera because I'm already so because I will say I've never fully rebounded from those years of. Yeah. You know, and so 
when it's my I mean again I feel when I walk out on stage to tell jokes I'm like good there but like yes. when it's like shoot a promo for a thing it's like ah. well it's also weird that you're you are better at update correspondence center SB's late night talk show host than I'm sorry Fred will you know what I mean like than those guys who are fucking outstanding at yes. the thing they do right and that is you're I better think... at late night than <laughs> than Sadek is probably would have been but you know what he's better at Ted Lasso be a goldfish Sam yeah <laughs> <laughs> there is um there is that thing that I, I I do think comes with like the wisdom of of doing this for a while is seeding away the things you're not good at. Like, don't try to hold on to a little piece of something that you're, you know, you can't break the top 50. It's also, Just yeah, what go. am I going to be the best? It's like yeah. what I did with stand up where it's like, all right, I'm not going to be like the, there are guys that are better at that, but I can figure out a niche that's like, oh, yeah. You're, yeah. Like, and then it's, you become that thing and that matters yeah. and that has value. And again, being, yeah, being the best at a, at a, a sort of, like I don't know, curated thing is so much better than being you know the hundredth. What can I come in first in? What can you come in first in? Meaning that's yes, the question that you have yourself. to ask, right? Um, or at least you know. No, be I'm in the asking you now. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, like what can I make a significant? What it, yeah. I can be an also ran as a sketch guy, or I can be uh, because at the end of the day, it requires a level of humility. Yeah, and a level of like uh, honesty with yourself. Yeah. And it does help too if you can genuinely enjoy watching other people be great at something because you, that also helps you know you can't do it, right? You're like, oh man, right? Like, it's not like it was easy for Bill or Andy or Jason. I watched how yeah, hard they were. Yeah, it's funny because the hater now is like, oh, I had panic attacks yeah. every. But he fucking made it look easy on TV. Yeah. And then that's the thing where you, you just, is that, especially watching somebody who, you see how hard it is and then they, when the camera rolls, they crush it. And you're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not even close to this. Yeah. But uh, it's nice to be somewhere where you feel you belong. And I, I am very, I feel like I'm very grateful for that because I know a lot of people in show business don't end up there. Well, yeah, it's a weird, it's a, I was talking to somebody yesterday, it's, a lot of people don't even know what they want to do. Right. So, to, in life, they don't, career, vocation, fam, like, and to be able to do it and succeed at it. But I also, the point I want to make with you is like, you fucking struggled. Yeah. It wasn't... <laughs> It, it, was. it sounds like easy, but I, but oh two, oh three, oh four, like it was not. I mean, it's that awful feel where you just feel helpless and you, yeah. nobody, and you realize nobody cares how badly you want it. Nobody cares how hurt you'll be if it gets taken away. I'm not saying they're unsympathetic. I, I do feel like a I lot don't of, think, I, but even that thing of like, I, today, I don't care how much people want it. Yeah, so I, I guess how. what I mean is the audience, a comedy audience oh, doesn't yeah. care how much you want it. And they don't, you know, ultimately if like they, given the choice of, you know, watching a sketch performer they don't love in their sixth season or, or finding out what the new thing is, like they'll choose the new thing every time as they should. But uh, one of my other favorite shoemakers as far as wanting something, I remember maybe my third year on the show, there was a sketch we'd done once. It had gone pretty well. A little of that'll move the chains. I think people argued, but it did well at the table. And between, uh, sorry, after the table, you you find out what, you know, gets picked, what doesn't. And it hadn't gotten picked. And so I went to Shoemaker's office, and I was very lucky to have somebody like Shoemaker that I could go complain to because a lot of people didn't have that. And mm -hmm. I could go complain to him as much as a friend as someone who was in the room. And I just sort of went in and very sullenly flopped on the couch, and he said, what's wrong? And again, he's been nothing but patient with me for the past 20 plus years. And he's very loving. And um, he, like I said, doesn't lose his temper. Salt, he's like just a salt of the earth. Yeah. Guy. And just smart. And and uh, also like incredibly seasoned, like going on almost 40 years in yes. the SNL and cinematic And started universe. And the part, like started as a script PA. So he's yeah. seen it from every angle. And so 
he said, what's wrong? And I said, I just, I just really wanted to do that one. And instead of empathy, he said, oh, you really wanted? Um, no one in the room had any idea. Let me call Lorne. Because maybe he'll change his mind if he knows you really wanted to do it. And I was like, all right, geez, back off. <laughs> By the way, cut to you and me talking six years later. You're the head writer and you needed somebody to cut a joke in a sketch. And they were like, oh, we really like that joke. And we were like, did you like it? <laughs> did you like that joke? I bet you did. Yeah. The audience did like it. Yeah. Fucking cut it because we don't have time for that part of the sketch of the, yeah. this part of the show but like well we like it so we like it that's our favorite part oh um, we love that part <laughs> well you can it's good news it was on uh, they printed it out and everything there's a cue card yeah. you can bring it home because yep. we're not using it today absolutely i'll get Put you the, the frame tape. i'll get you the tape uh it's also it was also funny seeing you go from being whatever talent to like more of a manager and I remember when you it was it was summer of auditions and like the the you had to let people know by noon the next day. And uh, and I remember you, you were like, yeah, I remember sweating about this. But now that I'm on the other side, I'm like, let's wait till 1159 tomorrow to decide. You just go like, oh, what's going to benefit me? What's the but like, why would I care? Um. And it, that's how life is. I will say one of the uh, great, Lauren let me tell a few people I got hired. And that was one of my favorite things I ever got to do. He Telling, let me, like, he'd be like, why don't you tell him? And it was uh, the best. He let me uh, pick a, pick the sketches, just pick yeah. the order of the sketch on the show. That's great. I yeah. mean, that's some real, like standing in front of that wall. Yeah. That's a famous wall. It's a famous, well, I didn't know you weren't supposed to touch it. Yeah, I thought only I didn't know only he touched it, and then I started touching it, and everybody just kind of weirded out. And then I I remember once a host, which is Lauren's very, again, people I think underestimate how his personality is so perfect for that job. Like he again doesn't lose his temper, certainly yeah. not with a host, right? No, and some hosts um kind of come looking for a fight a little bit weirdly, which is strange. And uh, I remember a host coming in uh, between dress and air and looking at the board in the order and being like and this is what you're going with and Lauren was like that's what we're going with and it was like we were all like because like for Lauren that was you know uh confronted confronting yeah was, yeah um okay so how would you say you've grown we didn't really cover family at all meaning I know they're great yeah what so what have as a father the who were you when you started and who are you now <sighs> that's a good question i don't know you know they i will say the fact that there's and i know this is not that impressive to a brennan but the fact that there's three of them now it does feel like a crew in a way that's really fun it is that's a crew it's that's a like crew eight in the 70s and um and it's just they're such good company and again you just give them room to be themselves and then enjoy the show, right? If you keep them fed and you keep them safe and you do the things that are necessary for them to thrive and be healthy, the rest of it, you just realize how much of it, as they get older, the choices they make and, and you just support their uniqueness. And they're very different. And yet they're also very much the Myers kids. And I love that part of it. And it's great. And it's as good as advertised yeah it's as good as advertised it's uh like if they can because they're not good all the time but they're the moments they're good are so sustainable more than any sort of professional success or or any i don't know interaction you have with other people like when they when you have a genuinely good moment with a kid like it's like ah uh, just feels like it like resets everything negative for like a 24 hour period somebody said it's like the love he always wanted mm -hmm. is from his kid i was like oh. i i feel like i do something i think it's a great mother's day present which is i over the course of a year lingerie <laughs> i write down every funny thing my kids say and then i type it up like on a typewriter 
and give right. it to my wife. And like it's it gets the list gets longer because they're just older and they say funnier things. And so it's you like, should slip in. It's, this is the devil's playground. You know what I should slip in is like one negative thing about my wife to see if uh, she read the whole eight pages. <laughs> uh that is a and is are they all things she's heard some she's heard some like because some i don't tell her everything and and uh, but like i just on my phone i have like a file of like funny things do you ever say, say to the kid like don't repeat that to your don't mother tell your mom. some are really good this is a very i mean this is one of my wife's all-time favorite which is i said to the seven-year-old uh hey let's be really nice to mommy today and he said, why? I'm like, she's just had a really stressful week and she does so much for us and she has to take care of so many things. So we should be really nice to her. And he said, or you could do some of that stuff. And I was just like, fuck. She's going to like <laughs> tell that to everybody the rest of her life. And what's funny is I don't know if that's more Alexi or you. Meaning like who wrote, who, which? Yeah, which brain which wrote Which part that? of the yeah. spirit did the kid get that from? It's true. I don't know either. But it is very funny that he immediately did the math and he's like, I think she'd rather, I don't think she wants our kindness. I think she wants us to chip in, which is 100% the case. Yeah, but come on. Fucking help out a little bit, kids, you know? Yeah. Um, here's a question that I don't think you'll like or want to answer, but okay. and we'll wrap it up. Movie of your life. Mm. Who plays you and what's the arc? <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, we all... We all do. I think it's almost important to think we're all underdogs. And I'm very aware that I'm not. Um, there are way bigger underdogs in this world. Uh, it's relative. Everything's relative. But I do think like part of your drive is to think you're an underdog, right? Right. Like I think so it's an important part of self-preservation to think that. And I think there's uh, uh, so. Uh, but at the same time, I realize like, I, you know, I don't know if people saw a movie in my life. They'd want to see an underdog story. I don't. I would like. But I you are. Yes, but yeah, I, you know what I mean, right. like Michael Jordan's not an underdog, but I know why he thinks he is. Of course, that's so. It's that. Yes, it's that. So I don't, I don't know what the obviously written by Martin Tina Fey. Oh, oh, Martin McDonough. Martin McDonough. I would love Martin McDonough. Would maybe be the happy if Martin McDonough, because I will say in Bruges, which if you don't know much about Seth Meyers, it's he's an in Bruges. Love. I Bruges, mean, he's yeah. a Bruges head. I'm a Bruges head, been to Bruges, B traveled to Bruges, took pictures, like, talked about the movie to movie. me endlessly. Film. And I do think, I think it's a what I love about that movie is it's a really great movie about male friendship. Mm -hmm. And I've had had a great many female friends in my life, but I think that certain male friendships, um, <clears> the <throat> one that I've had with Shoemaker, the one that I've had with old. Hem a Jones over there. Like, I wasn't going to get there. I'm trying to put a button. I was so scared that you were going to forget I'm trying about to button me. blocks here. Oh, fuck. Buttons. You do blocks. I, I do buttons. I, no, but look at who's speaking of <laughs> buttons. Uh, always one more button. Can I interest you, go you all in the, way the, to the top. Church Is that of Latter-day Saints? Is, is it, go ahead. Are you still making your own shirts? Yeah. This Are is really? one of the originals, yeah. That's great. Yep. I mean, I, don't, I just I've made them a, once. I've got a Brandon in my closet. Yeah, I made them once. They're oh, still really? for sale. Yeah, I just made them once, and I have a. I I, I got to put them back on sale. Anyhow, okay. go to neilfernan. dot com. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so fr male church. friendship. Yeah. So, but I but I will say uh, I have been. He's really important. You were because I had Shoemaker first, and I was just saying this to Shoemaker today. Like at the time where I was the most full of self doubt, like I needed two sources. You know the way a journalist needs two yeah. sources. I needed two sources to tell me it's you're better than you think. It's going to be okay. And I know it's weird to tell people it's going to be okay because you really don't know, right? But it helps. I think most people wake up in the morning and move on to the next day better if someone's told them it's going to be okay. And I had that with you and Shoemaker. And that was really important to me. That was my embrouge. Got a little mealy mouth. I got to be honest. It was, I, you were ready. I was ready to soar. The end of your the end of that statement, yeah. and you kind of went down. I I got mealy mouthed. It just went. I was waiting for like it just like but what I'm oh, looking oh, for I was see. like and because of two people, I gotcha. needed some. I need colons. I needed commas. All right, gotcha. It. Well, I will just say <laughs> that in my darkest time, there were two lights, two lights through the fog. They have turning into four tails. I know you're doing. A great mistake has been made with this Obama. They were Michael Shoemaker and Neil Brennan. <laughs>
And they steer the ship into port. And for that, I am. Who plays you? Who plays Shoemaker? Who plays? Um, Obviously, I'm Colin Farrell. He's Brendan Gleeson. And you can be, I guess, Ray Fiennes. You want Ray Fiennes? I guess. I always thought Chief Justice. uh, Sonia uh, Sotomayor, John Roberts. Should play Shoemaker. Oh, interesting. That's what he. I said uh, Sonia Sotomayor because he uh, went to the same high school as her. Cardinal Spellman in the Bronx. I did a um I did a charity event in the Bronx for this uh, wonderful organization called Bronx Works and I said to Shoemaker, "Give me a joke that'll work on the Bronx." And he said uh just say don't drive to City Island on Mother's Day. And it fucking crushed. <laughs> and you still don't know why. I, my understanding is uh, there's only one road in and one road out, and there's a lot of restaurants and uh, bad traffic. It's a Bronx native ch- yeah. cackling in the background. <laughs> or a guy who's familiar with City Island or Thank Mothers. Um, well, Blocks. I, what? Blocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's been a, ch- it was what a, what is a little chop on our descent, but... I love you like hell. I love you too, buddy. Blocks. Blocks. Blocks.